I want to be able to be descriptive in that I want to explain what happens out in the world, but at the same time, I, I don't want to lose that ethical component and I want to say what should happen. That's quite hard. I have to explain what does happen and sort of say what I think should happen. And do both things. Here's how I'm going to do it. This is a really simple example. The examples are going to get difficult in a minute, but this one is really simple. Imagine that all translators except you and me make mistakes. Okay, error exists. You're allowed to make one error, and you're translating a birth certificate. And a birth certificate is a bit of paper with several bits of language in it. One bit of language gives the name of the person born. Another bit gives the date of birth. Another bit gives the mother and father, if you're lucky. And then, sometimes at the bottom, you've got the name of, of the midwife or the doctor, or the person who brought this baby into the world. Okay? Now, if you're going to make a mistake, where is it going to be? The name of the person? No, sir. The date of birth? I don't think so. The name of the midwife? Well... Yeah. Okay. Um, about Obama's birth. Yeah. So actually the name of the midwife may might be very important if you want to trace something. Do you think if they made a mistake in that name he would not be president? Okay, perhaps that's a special case. We'll allow for <laughs> we're going to come to high risk cases in a minute. Okay, that would be a very high risk case. Um, as it is this is a, a real example. Um, from a, a colleague at the University of Granada in Spain, Roberto Mayoral, who has written a book on translating official documents like this. And he, he has been translating for years for the Pakistani community around uh, that part of Spain. And they all come in with birth certificates that have to be translated for the Spanish authorities for their visas, okay, and, and, and uh, citizenship applications, if they're lucky. Now, there, there are many problems. One of them is the Pakistani birth certificates doesn't list the mother's name, which is particularly unhelpful because the Spanish authorities need that. Uh, but that's okay. The translators get the passport and just copy the name off the passport. So much for equivalence. But uh, the, the client, the, the immigrant, is happy and the Spanish authorities are happy, so all that. The name of the midwife, it so happens that there is one midwife called Masawa who has brought all these Pakistanis into, into the world. <laughs> you know, 5,000 Pakistanis, all the ones around Granada, were brought in by this one miraculous midwife. Why Masawa? Because I'm told in Urdu, nobody has Urdu, do they? No, excellent, just as well. Uh, in Urdu, Masawa means midwife. So the people who issue the birth certificate not only leave off the mother's name, considered unimportant, frightening, but they don't care who the midwife is and just write midwife in Urdu, in the local language. Now, the translator knows this and just writes Masawa, transcription. And the Spanish authorities know this too. But they don't care, because they don't need that information anyway. And so they accept the existence of us. Masawa has become a legal fiction. And in fact, a fiction of equivalence. Uh, and the Translation Act works. The purpose is established. The equivalence belief is maintained. Uh, indeterminacy is obvious, because the translation has many things that are not in, even in the original. And everybody's happy. Okay? If you're going to make one mistake, this is where I want to get to, if you want to make one mistake, make it in the piece of information that is not important or conveys minimal risks. Some bits of language in the same document are high risk. Other bits are low risk. 
Admittedly, Obama's birth certificate is probably high risk in the very quality of the paper it's printed on. Okay? <laughs> Some documents are completely high risk, agreed. Uh, but in this case, it's, it's pretty clear that two are high risk and one is low risk. So if you're going to make a mistake, make it in the low risk. Okay? This is pretty important. Uh, it means that if I'm training translators, and some of you are getting trained as translators, perhaps I, we should be training you to work hard on some bits of a document. Work hard when there's high risk, it makes sense, doesn't it? Okay? And don't work hard when there's low risk. That is, go really fast through all the stuff that's not important. And that when it gets to be a high risk bit, work really hard. I, I found that I, I've given this, um, this theory, if you like, to uh, Bible translators, or actually about 120 Bible consultants. And uh, they went away and discussed, and they came back and said, yeah, you know what? We were going through these translations. They, this is the United Bible Societies, translates into all languages and all the jungles and deserts of the world. They said, yeah, you know, you get to these passages in the Bible where somebody begets somebody, begets somebody, you know, these <laughs> genealogies that nobody reads. They said, yeah, we found mistakes, but we never check for them because nobody reads them anyway. <laughs> and it's true. And the bits of the Bible that are, are really, really contentious, that lots of people pay attention to. I've talked about the doctrine of virgin birth, for example. Um, lots of work goes in there. Lots of notes, lots of study, lots of philology. And it makes sense. Now, unfortunately, when I teach my students in Spain this, the only thing they remember is they say, <laughs> you told us not to work too hard. Which, which is also true. If people start to translate, think of you when you really started to translate. You think everything there is important. You know, you're going to dictionaries and googling everything in the text, and it takes you ages. And it's just with experience that, that intuitively, you start to realize, hey, I can go fast there. You know, more or less. And here, I'll really focus. Note that if I train people in terms of this, I don't really need the term equivalence. I don't have to get you to believe in equivalence. I just say, look, work hard on certain passages. Yes, get accurate there, or give additional information, or think about alternatives. And don't work too hard on the rest. I'm not saying, you know, don't be equivalent, or you know, anything like that. You can, if you like, if you can, go, go for it. If you, if you can find a technical term, established official equivalent, do so. Why not? But this approach does not require fundamental belief in equivalence. For me, that's, that's essential. That's, that's the attraction of this approach. The approach is actually the one that's used in all sciences, which from so Heisenberg, you know, from the 1920s, but even before, in the 19th century, the scientists stopped believing in truth. They started to believe in probability. What's the probability of this being right? Economics is probabilistic. Physics is probabilistic. Chemistry is probabilistic. It's all probabilistic. Uh, why translation studies should be any different, I don't know. Anyway, what is risk? Technically, the probability of failing. But if you know what failing is, you've got to know what success is, I guess. And my ethics comes in, I say, eth ethically, success means cooperation, mutual benefits. Success is when everybody in the Communication Act gets something out of it. Okay? And that solves my need to have ethics built into the situation. And I could go further and say, the benefits must be greater than the efforts. Everybody should get out of the Communication Act more than they put in. If that doesn't happen, don't communicate. That's very abstract, but I'm going to try to illustrate it by doing a piece of descriptive studies. 
and I'm interested in looking at the other end. If my theory is true, you can look at the communicative work done by people and try to see what risks they're avoiding and what benefits they hope to attain. Okay? This may or may not work. I'm going back to, you remember that video we saw of the American soldiers going into the Afghan village? If you weren't there that day, uh, what happened? The Americans are receiving bombs from the general area of a village. A patrol goes out to investigate. They find the villagers have disappeared, and then they find an old man. He tells them a story about ants and wheat. The interpreter does not translate this story at all, uh, and uh, just tells basic lies. Um, and then as they go away, the interpreter says to the sergeant, I hate these people, I ask them all the time, they never give the right answer. And the last piece of the video is the frustrated American sergeant, after more bombs have been received, and he says, I just want to go and wipe them all out. I summarize the video, okay? Now, we saw that in the talk on ethics. And I think in that context, the reaction was, right, this is not an ethical interpreter. This could never happen here. This is bad. Okay, you're just excluded from your vision. Now I want to go back and try to analyze it in terms of risk management. Okay? Which is doing the descriptive work. It's a, it's a communication act, a quite complex one. There are at least four people involved, and I want to see what they're doing. For example, this is where it gets precarious. It may not work. Let's see here. This is your sergeant. Sergeant Adams is desperate to speak to someone, anyone. So that guy, when you told him to go get the elders, walked that way, and that kid walked that way. What's the kid doing? Poor sergeant is desperate to talk with someone. And he's just noticed a kid go that way, and another guy that, and he doesn't know what's going on. Why does he want to talk with someone? What's his interest in talking with someone? Wait. What's the risks he's facing in this particular situation? When you're doing very, very basic risk management, or if you're doing this in project management, those of you who do TLM, you're probably doing some project management, risk is very much a part of it. Uh, you try to sort out what's happening in your actions in terms of high impact, high frequency. So some things are high impact and high frequency, and you better do something about it. Okay? Because you're getting bombed, for example, with great frequency, you've got to do something. Other things are low frequency and low impact, and that's the things like Joseph begat, begat, begat in the Bible. Okay? They're not there all the time, there's not a big bit of negative thing that could happen, and who cares? All right? Others might be high frequency, low impact. This would be the case of the midwife, who's always the same person. You don't have to do about it, anything about it, but you might think about it. And similarly here, high impact but low frequency. Okay? I'm going to try to analyze that in terms of this communication act. Here, for example, is the sergeant we just saw. Why does he want to talk with someone? Well, he's got a problem. Bombs are falling on his troops. Are they falling with high frequency? No. But if they become high frequency up there, he's got to do something else. Okay? So he's there to talk with someone about that problem. Is it urgent? Well, not particularly. While he's there though, what they have, high frequency and high impact, every time they go out on patrol they get attacked. Not every time, but often or ambush, and there have been ambushes in this area. That's what he's worried about. When he says, hey, what happened? The kid went that way, the man went that way. What's happening? Where are they? Why are the villagers gone? Why does he want to talk with someone? He, here, he's worried about that problem. 
He wants to know where are the bad guys. All right? Secondly, he wants to solve that problem. Stop the bombs coming from there. Okay? He's got other problems, but they're minor. For example, high frequency, low impact, he's always dealing with other cultures. But hey, he's not a translator, he's not a cross-cultural expert, that's really not his main problem. He's not paid or trained really to deal with other cultures. And he's got another problem there, this interpreter, whom he may or may not trust. But come on, he's not using interpreters all the time, and it's low impact. There's, there's no reflection anywhere about the value of the interpreter. So he lives with that problem. Doesn't do anything about it. Okay? He's there to solve that one, and then that one. And he can live with these other problems. Alright, that's him. That's why he doesn't talk about the interpreting at all. Now, what's interesting here are other communication participants. Here we've got the village, the people of the village. As you can see, they're not there. And the people who live here? They're powerless and terrified, caught between America and her enemies. That's why they've disappeared. The people of the village, what's their high frequency, high impact problem that they have to deal with? They get visited or attacked by the Taliban. And that's high frequency and for a long time, because they know they're going to be there for a long time. Okay? They've got a low frequency, high impact problem, attacks by the US. But for them, this is more important than that. Okay? And they have no interest. Okay, and the, and the other, you can see, they get visited by both. A visit is, is you know, low impact, but high impact is, is, is an attack. They have no interest at all in talking with anybody who's American. And it's quite logical. If they're seen talking with the American, the Taliban will see them as traitors. If they explain to the Americans why they can't cooperate with the Americans, the Americans will see them as traitors. So they do the only thing they can in the Communication Act, and that is not talk. Disappear. When you have nothing to gain, when everything is high, whatever you do is going to be high risk and bad for you, get out of it. Okay, this might be applied to your love life at some stage in your life. <laughs> you get into situations where whatever you do, you're not, you, you, you can't win, and the only thing is get out of it. And sometimes in international negotiations, you'll find yourself interpreting or translating, and you get to a position, nobody's going to win here. They're all crazy, you know, they're all going to blow each other. I wish they would just not talk, and sometimes they should not talk. Logically so. Okay? It it's, makes sense in terms of risk management. Who else? Ah, there you go. Ah, you got me at Singade, Singade. Ah, no, Madlam, you got it, you got me at Kadek Singa. I didn't understand. We are fine, we have no problem here. Says it's good. Is it any wonder that the Americans feel baffled in these situations and the ordinary Afghans feel ignored? And he says, I'm telling this to you so you will understand our situation. Now, what is he trying to say? And why does he want to say it that way? Okay, now, it seems to me that for him, I mean, the risk is if he tells the Taliban the truth, that the Americans built the road and he, he would like to cooperate with the Americans. He doesn't want to go there. He's going to, he's going to you know, the Taliban will attack him. 